Hi, welcome back. So uh, this time it's an entirely different topic. Um, it's about uncovering remote peering interconnections at IXPs. And let me just briefly give you some motivation on this topic. So um, within the IX community, there was a lot of discussion about whether um, IXP uh, IXP remote peering destroys like some fundamentals of the internet and um, yeah, it's not meant to be there. And uh, I don't want to go down this uh, road today, but my thinking or the thinking of this uh, team of researchers from uh, Fourth Lancaster University, DKIX and AMSIX was actually, okay, but before we can really um, argue about this, we need to understand what's going on. So actually how much remote peering at IXPs um, can we find out there? And um, as we all understand what an IXP is, um, one of the main things I want to highlight here again is it sort of, or it should provide direct interconnection among AASs and keeps local traffic local. So at least if you look at public references like Internet Society, where the uh, benefits of Internet exchange points are summarized, um, those are the key points, right? It reduces cost and uh, it, it builds a local internet community. And um, building on those uh, fundamentals, um, we also need to keep an eye on the pressure in the market. So there's uh, pressure for diversifying peering, so increasing volumes, um, more pressure on ISs for denser and more diverse peering connections. And, a and thereby a fundamental shift of uh, peering practices that is required, right? Like the mental model two, 20 years ago was just, yeah, we have transit and a bit of peering, but now all those big CDNs are not necessarily IXP peering, but a lot of peering and also a lot of um, IXP peering. And a very high level, Definition of remote peering is when a network peers in an IXP without having physical presence at the IXP's infrastructure. I mean, I understand that's way more complicated because what is the IXP's infrastructure? If I'm at a co-location on the same campus, is it remote or is it not remote? And um, how is the game with resellers? So I could connect for financial reasons through a re reseller even though I'm hosted in the same facility. So it's a whole lot of complexity we're facing if we're asking the simple question, how much remote peering is out there? So um, how to peer remotely? It's connect to the XP peering fabric without collocating the route server, that's understood. And the main driver might be uh, equipment deployment at operational costs. So equipment, so you don't need multiple routers at different locations and the colo costs and all this stuff. And um, you can connect through uh, to multi multiple IXs with the same equipment, with the same uh, router, right? So, but the risk we're running into is remote peering uh, cancels out a lot of fundamental IXP benefits. So it introduces third parties. It reduces the resilience and reliability. So more complexity is always um, reducing resilience and it might increase latency. So let me define the goal for this uh, research study. And this was what goes beyond this cable. So we, we, we saw that cable and this is plugged into the IXP platform, but actually we have no clue uh, what's actually behind it. So we want to achieve more transparency as I um, explained in the beginning of this talk and identify remote and local peers from an external view without using Prior, uh, proprietary IXP data or um, using our internal view. So actually we just want to use public available data sources. And uh, this is beneficial for IXP operators and customer point of view as well. Because as an IXP operator you don't necessarily know whether someone is a remote peer or not. Because this is not um, in the um, commercial model of the IXP to really have data on this. And the features of remote peering. So what are the characteristics compared to local peering? And the ultimate question, which eventually was not answered in, in this uh, research study, but uh, needs a follow-up is, what are the implications on the resilience of the ecosystem? So let's quickly have a look at the state of the art. So today we just have uh, some very fundamental work, which 
only focused on the RTT-based remote peering inference. So they just detect remote peerings based on RTT measurements. Um, and this can be done. Some IXPs offer um, trace routes or um, pings through the looking glass. And this is within the fabric or very close to the fabric. And that, um, yeah, that's how they measure it. They use those to really infer RTT-based um, local or remote peerings. And they just defined a value and said everything um, with a higher latency than 10 milliseconds is an indication for remote peer, and then we assume it's a remote peering. Um, it's a conservative threshold for local regional IXPs, um, because for local this might be true, for regional it might be complicated if there are multiple facilities within the same sit city and the same layer two fabric. Um, but we will now get into this to ma more detail. So, to begin with, we have a validation data set to get some sense of at what we are actually looking. So, and with this uh, regional IXPs data set, we could see that 40% of the remote peers actually have um, RTT lower than 10 milliseconds. However, 80% um, of the remote peers have uh, less than one milliseconds RTT. So, it's not as black and white as the previous study has shown, right? So there are a lot of um, local um, peers that actually have a higher RTT, and there are a lot of remote uh, that have a lower RTT. However, it gives us, if, if we uh, look at the distribution, it gives us all a fairly good sense to, to just uh, have an overview of what's going on. And if we focus on wide area XPs and uh, have a heat map on the RTT between uh, the different ones, we see that 87% um, of the facility pairs actually have more than 10 milliseconds median RTT. And we use the data from the NetIX for, for this experiment. And uh, roughly 14% of the IXPs as of today can be classified as wide area IXPs, meaning they cover not just one metropolitan region, but um, expanded beyond. So our methodology, actually how it works, what we are building. And we pr propose a first principles approach to infer remote peering and uh, local peers. So first we want to take into account the port capacity. Because if an, IM, an AS has a very high port capacity at an IX, it's very unlikely that they're actually remote. So if we talk about hundreds of gigabits, um, the assumption is that they can't be remote. The next assumption is we doing um, RTT measurements with ping, and the RTT values provide some evidence how far an IXP uh, is. So the lowest ever of observed RTT um, gives the indication of um, the least, or at least this distance um, is guaranteed. So it can't be further away if we consider speed of light. And um, then co-location facilities. So we know from a previous study and public available data um, which co-location facilities hosting which networks. And um, this gives us also a good uh, data foundation to understand um, how far or where actually um, the equipment is. And we have multi-IX routers. Um, as I explained before, one router, multiple IXs. And um, of course, there's a lot of private connectivity over facilities, um, which is established without the IXPs being involved. So um, the algorithm we are proposing just uh, eventually does a very simple thing. So we get an inference whether a peer of an IX is remote, local, or we can't really tell because the data we're seeing is uh, contradicting each other. So the first step, and if we have a, one of those results, well, we stop the algorithm. And the first thing is we just focus on the port capacity from IXP websites and PeeringDB. So we know that PeeringDB is a rough indication. And we know that websites are not always up to date. But this gives us at least some ground truth. Then we uh, infer the distance between IXP members and facilities. And that's uh, how we basically build, um, from our vantage points, an IXP um, RTT map, which we use, including the facility information. 
And uh, for the facility information, we also have the GPS locations um, where actually um, the facilities are. And uh, correlated with the RTTs, we can really say uh, the physical distance and infer on the latency. So uh, in the last step, we localize uh, the facility level and the private connectivity. So we using um, as the step before, but just with the AS2 facility mappings, we're doing trace routing to see uh, which uh, yeah, hops we are traversing. And uh, given the order and the different facilities, we can uh, get a clue where a network is sitting and thereby whether it is remote or local. So does it work? Um, our first um, summarized results is that we don't really have a good coverage for all the peers we're focusing on in every data set. So sometimes, for example, with the port capacity, we just have 11% uh, coverage. However, um, this is a very uh, precise um, metric because it's coming from the network itself. And we didn't have any means to verify the accuracy. So overall, we can say that the coverage is 93 percent, the position 95, and we can have an accuracy of 94 um, percent with the validation data sets. So now the question, what are actually the results? Um, how does remote peering look in the wild? And um, first of all, we want to explain from the four steps I explained in the algorithm before, um, from which actually the inference is coming. And therefore, we are focusing on the top 30 IXPs uh, from three days in 2018. And um, on, the, on this plot, you can see, like, yeah, as I said, which step of the algorithm actually in, inferred uh, that this is uh, local or remote. And 10% of the inference can be made using the, only the pod capacity, um, RTT collocation facilities, and multi IX modules account for the majority of the inference. So that's the green part of the plot and 25% of the multi-IXP routers connect to more than 10 IXPs. So the inference results. So here again, um, a number of IXPs, and um, yeah, the results. So you see the orange part is actually the number of local peers, the yellowish part is number of remote peers, and blue is we could not make inference based on our algorithm. So what we found is that one third of members peers peer remotely with the IXP. 90% uh, of the IXPs have at least 10% of their peers remote. But for the really large IXPs such as AMSIX, DKIX, France IX, MSK IX, um, have 40% of their peers remote. And if we focus on the growth rate, therefore we looked at five IXPs where we had historical data and we look at um, join and uh, departure rates, and we see that actually um, twice as much um, remote peers um, compared to local peers. And remote peers have a far higher join um, versus departure rate. So the assumption would be a bit that maybe you're more flexible with the remote peering and it's easier to uh, deep peer or to access, but we also have a, a good number of peers that turn from remote peers um, to local peers. So, or it could be an in, uh, indication of a saturation of the system, right? So everyone in this uh, metropolitan region or who has or wants to establish a pop there um, has it already, and if you want a small capacity and don't want to go into this um, area, then you rather do it via remote peering. So um, this is actually, I'm skipping it. Um, remote peering routing implications. So um, actually we were a bit curious about the past. So we um, also did a trace route measurement study for um, remote peers. It was 380 members and um, actually it was done at DKX Frankfurt. And we saw that 66% of the cases um, the trace routes included the closest IXPs to the remote peer, but in 34% of the cases, um, we do not comply with the expected hot potato uh, routing access strategy. 
However, the hint is this is uh, trace routing and this can't be considered as, as crown truth, right? This is rather an indication. So we compiled all the data and all the stuff we have and build a website to really visualize it. Um, please go there and check it out. However, note this is not the fastest website and I, we experienced some, some uh, load uh, issues this morning already, so maybe you check it rather tomorrow or tonight. And um, yeah, you can uh, play around with it. You can check out different IXP facilities. Um, you can query for different ASs. And um, you, it's showed on the map, and um, it also gives you an indication whether it is likely to be a remote peer or local peer, and uh, whether it's outside of the um, RTT range or not. So let me conclude. The, we built a new methodology to accurately infer peers connected to IXPs through remote peering, and thereby we try to increase the transparency of the peering ecosystem and illuminate peering trends and practices. So the takeaway is a lot more remote peering and faster growing than local peering. Um, remote peering becomes popular practice in almost um, everywhere, and um, we made it publicly available through our web portal. The remaining future work is to really use those inferences to really get some information on um, yeah, how often do the links fail or such things. So if it's increasing or decreasing the resilience of the ecosystem internet and also have an interpretation of traffic levels, right? It might be that, or it is the case that it's a huge um, number of remote peers at an IXP. But I'm sure without um, having proven it that they not account, or they cannot be accounted for the majority of the traffic at the IXPs, right? So. Um, even though we see a lot of remote peers, are they that important um, if we take the entire internet ecosystem into con consideration? So thank you. That's it from my side, and I'm happy to take your questions. Camilo Cardona from Entity Communication. Uh, hi, so I'm one of the authors of the previous uh, study. Thank you for mentioning the, the study. So I have one comment there. In our defense, what we wanted was to give a low, like a... a, a lower bound. Yeah, a lower bound in, in yeah. how much remote peering was used. And I, we, we wanted to reduce the number of false positives and just, I mean, just mention that. Yeah. I mean, um, you um, did a very good job in academia until um, your paper was published. No one knew about remote peering. When I talked right. about remote peering, they were like, what are you talking about? So yeah, right. you, you got it started. So yeah, thanks thank for that. So uh, just one question. Uh, when we did the study, there was one particular case in which one router in, I think in Russia, I think it was BK, they, were, they, had it, they had like nine different remote peering sessions from the same router. And, um, well, we didn't look too much into that, but I don't know if you have any, any more of this type of curiosities, which I, which I think is, well, it's, it's fun to know whether you some more of these cases happening of, uh, I don't know, n number of sessions from the same routers or stuff like this. Yeah, so um, the max we observed was 15, actually. And it's, I wouldn't say commonplace, but it's, it's not super rare. So you can find it here, here and there. And yeah, it, ha it happens. <laughs> so I guess that's it. Thank you so much. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>